Let me invite you, please, in your New Testaments to Titus chapter 2. The main focus of our study tonight, the passages we will be examining right there in that one place in Titus chapter 2. And we will begin with a look at verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12. I have been preaching for about half my life, something like 22 years. And I have a file on my computer with every sermon that I've ever built on it. So I could go back this week and do some research on how often I have preached on the great grace of God. And when I did preach on the great grace of God, what passages did I use and how did I present that? And what I can tell you from the first half of that preaching life, the first 10 or so years, that I really only titled lessons with the word grace in it maybe once a year or so, maybe even less often than that. And it was really always about Titus 2, 11 and 12. The objective in those sermons was to get here as fast as possible. There were derivatives of this, like I have a sermon that says grace is great, but it also includes law. I got to the law very quickly. You can fall from grace. I preach that one the most times, which is certainly true. But in all of those passages and studies, we always got here and read this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and appearing Verse 14, of Christ who gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. It's a great passage. We'll be looking at it tonight. It's our central passage for tonight. But I can tell you that for a long time, my preaching on grace was like this. Five to ten minutes of reminding you that God loves you and God's grace through Christ is for all and a full 30 minutes preaching the same sermon that I preached the week before and the week after about going out and doing good. Ultimately, those sermons were about you being good, doing right with very little focus on grace. But something changed in my life about 10 years ago. It started to change the way I talked about grace. It wasn't just a starting point to get to what I really wanted to talk about, which was you being better. I actually started preaching about the true, deep, surrounding, amazing grace of God. And here's what changed in my life. Are you ready? You're really going to want to write this down. I started um, I started reading my Bible. That was it. That's what I did. For 10 years, I I read on topics of the Bible. I read sections of the Bible. I I, I Googled or searched for topics and read and pieced sections of Scripture together. But in 2012, for like the first time in my life, I just sat down and read the Bible through. And pretty much every year, for the most part, and recently more often than that, I'm just reading through the New Testament every 260 days until Jesus comes back. And you know what you find out? Grace isn't some little five-minute introduction to get to go be awesome. Grace is the awesome part. Grace is the part that makes everything else even work. And so Titus 2, 11 and 12 is a big deal. But verse 11 is the biggest deal. And verse 12 is the product of that big deal. It's what comes out of it. And I hope that you're with me and you're thankful for this. Because I could just cite this morning's sermon to try to make you feel very uncomfortable. Remember the three things we all have to do to be right with God? How are you doing at those three things? I'll just choose one. How are you doing at keeping all of God's commandments? Do you even know all of God's commandments? Do you understand all of God's commandments? I didn't see any, you know, there's derivatives. I almost said the holy kiss thing. There's derivatives on how some of those get applied and what's traditional. But I just mean like the moral stuff. Like, like, do you even under, none of us here keep God's commandments perfectly. And yet he said, if you walk in the light, you got to keep the commandments. You know what you learn very, very quickly if you have a mirror in your home? That this is only going to work if God's grace is all over your life. If God is working with you and supporting you and helping you and motivating you and purifying you and watching you grow at a snail's pace, but always in the right direction. This is where this series originated for me that I've had the opportunity to teach a lot this year. This is what Bible reading, New Testament 
unending Bible reading revealed to me that everything begins with the mercies of the Lord, that we are lavished with the mercies of the Lord in every conceivable and inconceivable way. And it's like a fire hose in your mouth of just glory bursting into you from God. And that changes you on the inside and a nice little trickle of good works comes out the other side of it. But it is fueled by the great grace of God. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to take you through Titus 2. And there's a lot about godly living and good behavior. But I want you to understand that it is God's grace that makes it possible and you need it more than anything else. And if you're motivated by it and you live in gratitude for it, you will glorify God every day. You will praise him in every way and you will do everything you can to do what's right because of his glory. So I want to look at this with you. Go with me to Titus chapter two. And what I want you to see is the verse there that we often discuss, verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and live sensibly, righteously and godly in this present age. There's, that verse is still there. We still need to do that. But this text begins with the grace of God. I'm talking about the grace of God that occurred before you even received it. The great things that God did to make salvation possible for you before you were even breathing. And it's found in verse 11. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's not a big deal. It's the biggest of all deals. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. It's greater than anything you'll ever accomplish. That before we were born, before this country was born, God showered his grace upon this earth in the form of Jesus Christ, whom he filled with grace and truth. And he delivered a pathway of salvation to every person. The fact that there's even an opportunity to be saved is purely God's grace, not as a result of works. Anything that comes after that is only possible because of what God did before you ever did anything. Before you ever did anything, God filled you with his grace. And at the end of the journey, when this journey is over, guess what we're going to find on the other end when Jesus comes back? We're going to find more grace, more mercy, more unmerited favor, more undeserved blessings. Nobody in this room believes they deserve heaven. I hope that you do not because you do not. But by the grace of God, you will also be saved. And this is verse 13. We are looking for something. We are looking for the blessed hope and we are looking for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us. We'll talk about that in a minute. We believe that we will see Jesus. Will he save you on the basis of your accomplishments? I hope that that is not the basis of it all. He will save you on the basis of his promises, on the basis of his purifying blood, and on the basis of your growing faith, immature and incomplete as it will be. We're trying to deepen our love for each other and our belief in Jesus and our obedience, but none of us are fantastic at almost any of it. But we make our effort and we see grace before and we see grace after. And while this verse is very important, it's very important. It is seated right in the middle of God's great grace. The only way this verse can even begin to make a difference is because of what God did before I was born, what God is going to do in eternity for me. And then look at verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. That didn't just happen before you became a Christian. This verse happens every single day. Every day of your life, the power of Jesus redeems you from lawless deeds. We saw that this morning in 1 John chapter 1. We do not always walk in the light. We do not always obey every commandment. We do not even always understand every commandment. We do not always love each other like we should. But even when we fall, he purifies us from our lawless deeds. He sanctifies us and he continues to save us. You are living in the grace of God in every aspect of your life. And this middle portion is only possible because of his grace, but it also ought to be the result of his grace. Because you believe in all that he is and all that he has done, because of his mercy around me, I will deny ungodly things. 
I will not deny ungodly things in order to receive his grace because I'm not a good enough denier to achieve that grace. I deny ungodly things because of the great grace of God, which changed my heart. I deny the pursuit of worldly desires and I choose to be sensible and righteous and godly. Why? Because of what Jesus did, because of what Jesus is going to do, and because of what Jesus does for me every single day. If you get this out of order, you will give up. If your order becomes the middle box has to happen first, and when you get really good at the thing in the middle, grace will begin to come into view. You will fail. You already know that you will fail and you will give up. You may stay in the pew for another 30 years. Stay in the pew doesn't mean you haven't given up. But you'll find that your salvation is unsecured. And you have constant question of whether God will save you. If I have to get everything in the white box correct in order for God to save me, I am unsaved. But if I'm doing these things and striving for these things and committed to these things because God has saved me, I will have a reason to fight for this every single day. And I will do it with a smile on my face and hope in my heart. Now, here's something that interests me. So I'm going to do exactly what I always do. I'm going to talk about your works now. I got my great stuff out of the way. Thank you. What does all this mean, this middle portion? Like, okay, you go, okay, motivated by grace. God is so good to me. I want to do this. Well, you know what's really cool about Titus 2? He goes ahead and spells it all out for you. He says, what I actually want you to do is a little bit more specific than this. In fact, it's kind of gender and age specific. And I want to present these things to you and I don't want to take very long to do it. But I want you to see that if God's grace is vibrant in your life, here are the ways you will be exhibiting it. Some of the things on these lists are going to be easy for you. And some of them will be the bane of your natural existence. Some of them you'll have no problem with. You'll say, not a big deal. And some of these will be a big deal until the day that you die. Fight for them because of what is around you, because of who God is to you. Let me show it to you. Older gentlemen, you're first. Titus 2, interestingly enough, walks you into all of the things that God wants us to do by his grace. He says, first of all, in verse 2, he says, older men, listen carefully, gentlemen. Let me tell you what it means for you to live godly and sensibly and righteously. He says, I want you to be temperate. I want you to be dignified. I want you to be sensible. I want you to be sound in faith, sound in love, and sound in perseverance. Can we talk about what some of these words mean? The word temperate here means different things in different places, but this word means not drunk. This word means sober. It means you cannot eat things or drink things or smoke things that take you from a person who's focused on why you're here and you become less focused on why you're here. Gentlemen, do not compromise your sobriety and your focus. That is the meaning of the word temperate. To be dignified means to be honorable. To behave in a way that brings honor to you, to behave in a way that brings honor to God's people and brings honor to the God of heaven. This is getting up every day deciding how can I behave in a way that glorifies the name of God instead of bringing some opposition upon it. The word sensible is my favorite and three of our age groups and gender classes get this same word. Older ladies, you get a free pass. You get something else. But for the rest of us, it says, older gentlemen, can I ask you to be sensible? Can I tell you what this word means? It's not easy. Sounds easy. It means self-control and the willingness to curb your ungodly desires. Those things that want to defy God's grace or challenge God's grace or ignore that God is around my whole life. I just want this and I want to pursue it and grab it and take it. And it destroys families and it destroys lives. Be sensible, gentlemen. Control yourself and curb those desires. Be sound. Sound just means healthy. Just means like proper. Be sound in your faith. Be sound in the way you trust the Lord. Be sound in the way you love God and others and be strong and stable and persevere in all of these things. Now, before we leave you, gentlemen, I don't want to dissect this too much further. I want you to understand, gentlemen, that the only way this is possible is with the grace of God in your heart. 
with the understanding that God is with you, that he is helping you, that he will forgive you, that you can make this right. And the only motivation to do it is going to be God's grace behind you and your gratitude for his goodness. Because you will find an excuse in this world to violate all five of these. You will find something that happens in the natural world that demands that you forsake these things. You will find some excuse for what is happening with your spouse or your neighbor or someone to justify bad behavior. But if this list is about God's grace in your life, then nothing else can stop you from fulfilling it. These are natural extensions of our belief in the Lord. Older women, God has words for you. God's grace has appeared. It will appear again one day and it appears in your life every day. So as a result of that and because of that, likewise, older women are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women. And we'll talk about the young women in a moment. I want you to look at this list. Because of God's grace and for the sake of it, In honoring it and thankful for it, this is what older women are to be. This word reverence, there are two words in this this list that are very interesting. To me, the last three are are pretty self-explanatory for our older ladies. I don't know if you call yourself an older lady. In preaching, I'm allowed to say older. I'm not allowed to say old. So there are no old women here today, but there are older women. The last three are not challenging, but they challenge you. And it's not enslaved to wine or to much wine or compromised by wine. That's very sensitive. That would be kind of like our our word that we saw with gentlemen. Teaching what is good means that God has given you older age because he wants to use you in a special way. He wants you to be a helper of the younger women. He wants you to be an example to them of what God's mercy can do and how it can change a life and how it can infuse it with hope and peace. And of course, encouraging younger women. But the first two are very interesting to me. The word reverent means befitting of, and this is interesting, it says men, places, actions, and God. And and I want you to think about this a minute. What it's saying is, ladies, in every environment you're in and in every role that you're in, be it with a man like your husband or an environment like the church or in the presence of God, there are roles that are appropriate for you that you honor, you have reverence for the role that God has given you. You will have every reason in the world to say, I need to step out of that role for one reason or another, usurp that role for some good result. But the word reverence is not just revering God, it's revering the roles that God has assigned to you with respect to men and churches and this world and God. And malicious gossips. I mean, it just says it for older women. I'm not picking on anybody. But did you know that the word here for gossips is the word devil? This word, this is, what is it, diabolos. It's translated devil almost everywhere. And here it says, older women, don't be malicious devils. But it also carries the description of gossiping. That's a powerful idea. To spend time sharing things that I don't have a right to share or speaking ill of someone in a way that gets out of order of what God wants me to do is behaving in the nature of the devil. And so as an older woman, I know you look at this list and you agree with everything on it. I suspect that you struggle with something on it. Almost everyone will on almost every list. I want you to understand that the reason why you're doing these things is because of the greatness of how God is to you, what God has done for you. And the reason you can even keep trying is because of what God continues to do for you. Don't neglect his mercy and his grace, older women. This is what it means to live godly in this present world, at least in this text. Younger women, it says the following. It says in verse four that older women are to encourage the younger women. And then they're given a list of five things as well to love their husbands, to love their children. So you can see by younger, it's extending past the adolescent stage into young adulthood. Love their husbands, love their children, be sensible, be pure be workers at home, be kind, be subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. When I see the word of God here, I'm immediately connecting it to God's grace a little while later. The word of his grace, the truth of his grace. Younger ladies, he has been kind to you and gracious to you and he wants to use you to prove how good that he is. And this is the way that he wants to use you. He wants to use you in your young adulthood in the way that you love and serve and honor your husband 
and the way that you raise and train and love your kids. Also in the way you are sensible, which is the same word we saw with older men, that you curb your natural desires to defy this plan. And I think there's a lot of that in our culture today to just throw out this whole middle box. Keep the grace, throw out the box. That's not good. We're going to keep all the grace. We're going to rewrite the box. The box is what's wrapped in the grace and what's inside of it is to honor the roles that are given to you at your home, to care for your home, to support your husband in your home, to be kind to all and subject to your husband. These are things that ladies will be challenged with their whole lives, but you do so because of God's grace purifying you and you do so knowing that his grace will restore you every day. But you cannot abandon the box in the name of grace. This is what God wants younger women to strive for. Younger men, he goes and says the following. Likewise, urge the young men, and here's our same word, to be sensible, which means to curb that verse six, those desires, those impulses. Here's what he says to young men, and I'll list them all here. He says, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Now, that's interesting with both younger women and younger men. He adds this idea to the young, because I think it's easy when you're younger to forget about the implications of what you do. That if you choose to defy God's grace or ignore it and do things that don't honor his grace, you actually start to do damage. I think when we get a little bit older, we kind of know that. I think older men and older women know that there are repercussions and results outside of their circle in their behavior. You should know that. But younger people need to know that as well. And that's why younger women were said, you need to behave this way so you don't bring dishonor upon God's word. And younger men, you need to behave this way so that no one will have anything bad to say about us. I mean, you represent the church, even as a young man. And what should a young man be? He needs to curb his appetites and have self-control. Perfection, unattainable, effort required. Perfection, unattainable, effort required. Because of his mercy and with his mercy. If you take the motivation of God's mercy out of a young man's heart, I'm just going to talk to our young men a minute. Here we go. You take the motivation of the goodness of God out of a young man's heart with all the carnal things that he feels in his body and the confusion of his mind and the restlessness of the life stage that he's in. And you also remove the idea that God is with him and will pick him up and will forgive him and that grace is greater than all of his sins. If you take grace out of a young man's life and you tell him to go do these five things, do you know what will happen? I can take you probably to plenty of local churches that can tell you exactly what will happen. They lose most of their young men. They lose them because they told them week in and week out what to do and what not to do. And what we didn't tell them is that God is with you, beneath you, around you, for you, helping you, loving you, and saving you. Now let's go do this. It's very different when grace is everything around everything that we do. Gentlemen, because of how good God is, be an example of good deeds. Be somebody who knows the doctrine of God's word and lives purely for it. This word dignified, I love very much. This is the one I picked out to talk to our young men about. This word dignified, you're going to like this, guys, means entitled to respect. Our young men want respect. I'm a man now. Why don't you respect me? Deal. Be respectable. And you got it. This isn't about young men going around going, hey, everybody, you're, you're supposed to respect me. This is about young men going, if I will go out and behave in a respectable way, then people who love God will respect me as a fellow brother in Christ and an encouragement and a Christian. Young men, we want to respect you. We want to look up to you. I, my, some of my littles already look up to you. You go out and be dignified. And then, of course, sound and speech just has to do with the, the, just the words that we say and the attitude that we have. Simple instructions. I just wanted you to see that we preach Titus 2, 11 and 12 a lot. And maybe there are a lot of other things I could pump into verse 12 
things about what it means to ignore worldly desires and take you to other passages in the New Testament. In verse 14, when it says good deeds, I can take you around the New Testament and show you what some of them might be, but there's no need tonight. Titus was told by Paul exactly what they, what they are. And that's what they are. At least that's the beginning and the center of what they are. I want to finish with this. I want to finish with Titus 3, 1 through 8. Will you read it with me? In the way that, that Titus 2 is set up, it's like this. Here's how you need to behave. You've got grace before you, after you, and around you, and your good works are kind of in the middle of God's grace. Titus 3, 1 through 8 tells the same story, but it just reverses it, and I kind of like it. So we're going to finish with this. Titus 3, 1 through 8, last, last thoughts. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable and be gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating each other. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, that's grace, He saved us grace, not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that being justified by His grace, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Concerning those things, I want you to speak confidently. The stuff I just said, so that those who have believed God, believed in the grace of God, will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable. Let me finish with this. It, it all kind of gets inverted here, and I think it's just really kind of interestingly and cutely rearranged. In this case, the first thing and the last thing that he says is, go be good. Verses 1 and 2, go treat people well. Treat authority figures well, whether it be parents or government or husband, whoever it might be. Verse two, don't malign anyone, be peaceable with everyone, be gentle, show every consideration. It's just another way of wording what we saw in the previous chapter. And then in verse eight, he says, I want you to be careful to engage in good deeds. Sounds a lot like the previous chapter, but this time that's the bread, but the meat in the middle is all of God's grace again. You know why you do all those things? Because you were a fool. You were caught in your sin. You were dying in your sin. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your sin. But God came in, verse 4, and God demonstrated His kindness through the Savior and His love for us, and God saved you. He did not save you based on the deeds which you had done in righteousness. He saved you because He was merciful because He chose to wash you and regenerate you and renew you and fill you with the Holy Spirit and pour upon you richly that Spirit through Jesus Christ our Savior. He chose to justify you by His grace and make you an heir full of hope and saved forever. Grace. Because that's who I was, because that's what he did, and that's what he's going to do. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat people well. And I'm going to carry out the work that God wants me to do. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I'm going to get an email once a month telling me I'm not doing it good enough. It's fine. It's okay. It's fine. You're right. You're right. Making mistakes. Trying my best. I'm speaking for you and me both. I will not stop trying my best. I will not stop getting up and trying to do better and trying to reform relationships and trying to be sensible and trying to be honored to God because even on my worst day, God's grace is here for me. He purifies me and washes me and cleanses me and loves me as, and all he asks me to do is be sorry for my mistakes and to just keep trying. I think everybody can do that. Turns out salvation's for everybody because everybody can admit their mistakes and everybody can try their best. You're, all of our bests are a little different, but the point is God's grace is best 
And when it's in place, salvation is available to all. I want you to do what's right. If you need to come forward and do what's right. I, I listened to a sermon the other day. A guy, you, I don't think anybody here knows him, but boy, I'd heard that they had all these uh, responses. They had like three or four people come forward, a couple baptisms. And I thought, nobody ever does that for me. So I thought, I'm going to listen to a sermon. And man, he got to the end. He started walking and like yelling and pointing. It was awesome. And people were like, okay, and they all started coming forward. I, I don't do that. And I respect the fact that he did that. I thought he did really well. I don't do that. I'm not here to get in your face and challenge you and threaten you. I am here to just show him to you. And I pray that he is so impressive to you and you are so thankful to him that you will not leave this place without doing what is right, whatever, whatever that is. Because of his mercy and in preparation for even more of it to come. If we can help you, if you need to respond, come now as we stand and sing.